Okay, welcome to episode five of Talking Prisoner. Today we have another amazing guest with us. She was one of Wentworth's most violent inmates, occasional top dog. Her character survived a great siege, tried to kill the freak, escaped, <laughs> started her own massive riot, one of Wentworth's greatest riots, I, I think, and meant with a violent ending. She's a well-respected actress and has worked in film, theatre and television for over 40 years. She's appeared in many TV shows such as The Flying Doctors, Chances, Neighbours, Janus, House Husbands, The Secret Life of Us, and of course, the most greatest show in the world, Prisoner. Welcome to Talking Prisoner, Louise. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Hello, it's everyone. A, it's an absolute honour to have you on. Um, we, oh, aren't you kind? Yeah, there's just so much we want to ask you about, especially Prisoner. I know the fans are eager yeah. for us to get into it. But first, yep. we'll just touch a little bit on your um, childhood and growing up. Yep. That's okay. Yep. Yes, of course. Of course. Did you enjoy school and what were your favourite subjects? Look, I enjoyed school to a point, but um, I think I was possibly at the wrong school. I think I would have been a great advocate for um, being placed into a, a more creative environment. But look, you live and you learn, don't you? And that's no fault upon my parents. I loved anything to do with history. I was a great sportswoman and remain very active in the sport world. And I loved, of course, anything to do with art and performing and singing and dancing and all of that. So, you know, but maths wasn't a strong point, Ken. <laughs> I did have a tutor and I still failed. And that'll give you an impression of that. <laughs> Likewise. <All right. laughs> so after school, what did you do once you left school? What sort of jobs did you take on straight out of school? Well, I was supposed to go to university. That's what my parents had planned anyway. I was supposed to become a lawyer. That's what my parents had planned. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, and as I was at university doing the, you know, welcome to campus and have a look at the thing o day, I just turned to my mother and said, I can't be doing this. And she said, well, you'll have to tell your father and the rest is history. So I then started um, cooking in nightclubs and um, working in the fashion world while I was studying to be an actor. And then I upped and went to Europe for about three years and hitchhiked around Europe and did whatever during that time. And then when I came back to Australia, I went back to study at National Theatre and then I got cast into Prisoner and the rest is history, as they say. Just quickly, what, what was it like telling your dad that you didn't want to be a lawyer? Look, I think it was worth telling my mother. My father was a very reasonable... My mother's still alive, but my father's dead. But my, my father was an extremely reasonable man, but he was an accountant. <laughs> <laughs> not that that's casting aspersions on accountants but they're very in my experience and I've only got my father to to recommend this but they're very you know even security minded you know do the right thing in that way and that just wasn't me I, I look I think he knew exactly who I was and I think it just terrified him that I was probably going to do something a whole lot worse <laughs> Well, I, I guess we, I, we won't need to ask where your parents in show business. Yeah. Oh, God, no. My mother was a trained nurse. And as I say, my father was an accountant. I mean, you couldn't have got further from where I got this. I don't, who knows? Although my, my, my father was, at, were, and both my parents were very interested in the arts and took me to the theatre and to music and blah, blah, blah. So, I mean, that was cultivated early on. And I did classical ballet and my father painted and so on and so forth. So, you know, there was an influence in the sense that they had an appreciation of art and and that's been instilled in me and remains so. I'm, I'm, I mean, I use art in my work all the time and I use music all the time in my preparation for work. So, you know, these things come to you through your parental line, don't they? And you're just not quite sure. So despite them trying to make me a lawyer, they misstepped by introducing me to the arts. <laughs> <laughs> I blame it entirely on them. <laughs> you were also a voiceover artist, apparently. What sort of oh, yeah. voiceover work have you done and how is that compared to working in TV? 
I've worked in the voiceover world for, well, nearly as long as I've worked as an actor. I mean, I do a whole range of things in the voiceover world. I sell products, for instance. I mean, for about four or five years, I was the voice of David Jones, the national voice of David Jones. So any David Jones ad you heard, heard through that period, you would hear my voice selling, you know, anything from you? fridges to, yeah, fridges to shoes to, you know, whatever, makeup. So I I do the advertising world, but then I do a lot of book reading. You know, so for instance, I was the voice the voice of Kerry Greenwood's one line of character, Karina, who was a baker. So I did a whole about eight books of hers, and then I do uh, animation um, voiceover. So I might play a character, a person, or 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 an animal. I mean, I played a kangaroo for a long time on a on a children's show. Then I do voiceover work for television stations for programs. But you may not realise it's me, but, you know, you're listening to the voice of, of an actor whenever that happens. So it's, it, it, it's a really interesting world to be part of, actually, because it, it doesn't require the same skills as literally as, as performing to a live audience or, or for television. But certainly it's got a skills base that needs to understand, you know, projection of the voice and the story that you're telling and all of that stuff. So they do cross over. It's a, it's a really interesting world. Um, last question before we jump into Prisoner. You also yeah. teach drama methodology. Can you explain yeah, I do. to the fans what that what that is? What the hell is that? What is that? Um, <laughs> what the hell is that? Um, well, I having never gone to... I never went through a university course as an actor. I just hit, hit the ground running and started working. And so I would train in various classes around Melbourne. But then I became, after working on Prisoner and watching a lot of the women, some, particularly someone like an Annie Phelan, who was incredibly skilled, I became aware at a very young age that there was more to this than met the eye. So I started to interrogate it from methodological point of view and became very interested and remain very interested. In fact, I was online this morning before this interview with my teacher, in, one of my teachers in America. So I still train now on it, whatever I do. So I started to get very interested in um, actors methodology that isn't available in Australia. So I went before COVID obviously would go to America regularly and wow. train in a whole range of things that you can't, I'm the only teacher of this particular, one of the particular forms of work I do here in Australia, which is absolutely fantastic. Wow. And it means that my work is always changing and I'm always changing and I'm accommodating those changes through these various methodologies and also I just love being an actor. It's infinitely interesting to me and it's never ending and I've never learned it all. And, I, and I'm just at the beginning of it, trying to understand it and trying to do it better. So I want always that my work is fostered by me as an artist. I'm fostering my work every day in some form, every single day. It's funny you're saying you're just learning now. I mean, going back to- Oh God. You're just like an amazing actress from back then. And you're saying you're just learning. Oh, aren't you kind? Oh, Aren't you I mean, kind? Gosh. Yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting to hear that. Now we get into Prisoner. You appeared apparently in 151 episodes of Prisoner and some very big storylines. We have lots of Prisoner questions and also sure. we'd love to go over some breakdowns of episodes you were in. Your parts on, on Prisoner was you had three roles before Lou Kelly. You had... Did I? Yeah, you were the nurse when uh, Lizzie had a heart attack and was in hospital. I remember that, yeah. Then you were the shop assistant in the camera shop when Nolan McKenzie was stealing the camera. Right. <laughs> which was a great she episode. gave up being a nurse and she started working in a camera shop. Camera yep. shop. And then you were yeah. uh, Tammy Fisher, an inmate in 1983. Really? 1983. Yeah, just for one one episode. So, wow. <laughs> and Tammy there you Fisher go. I've obviously, I, 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 obviously, I've got amnesia as well. <laughs> <laughs> How did you get those parts? Was that um? To be honest with you, I, I, you know, it's not a vivid memory. I do remember auditioning for Lou, but I don't. I remember vaguely doing the nurse because I remember that I had to go to the toilet with one of the actresses who was attached to a, a catheter thing. And then it's afterwards, I thought to myself, why am I doing this? It's not a real catheter. <laughs> I'm walking into the toilet with this person. But I don't remember. Or I, don't, I mean, I don't remember auditioning for those roles, but I, I definitely remember auditioning for Lou. Can you tell us about um, how you got the part? I remember they were auditioning for a role. They didn't have the role, except there was no other actresses there. 
which I thought was odd because in those days you did cattle calls and you, you just went into a room and there were 65 million people in the room and then you went in next, 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 you know. And so when I arrived, there wasn't anybody else there. And then, but also the character didn't have a name and I just did this audition and didn't think much about it and thought that's a bit odd. And then, then basically the next day I was cast as Lou. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, I mean, really, like 24 hours later. And again, the rest is history because from there on in, but she wasn't, what was interesting was that she wasn't really designed in the way that she unfolded. Because one one thing that's always interested me is that people assume that people who are dark or violent or aggressive or in any of that sort of, you know, anywhere in that household of abusive kind of qualities or tendencies, that they lack a sense of humour. And I completely disagree with that. And so across my career, I've played a lot of authoritative figures for various reasons, which we can discuss. But what I've found is that most authoritative people don't play at being authoritative. They play a very relaxed world because they can, because they are authoritative. So I wanted to enjoy doing Lou. And by enjoying doing Lou, I wanted her to be funny. And so that role kind of eventuated because I got into it and then it took off. Do you know what I mean? Not to put tickets on me, but what I'm saying is the writers followed where I went rather than me following where the writers went, which was a great thing. Just, just and a wonderful back, thing for a writer. Going back to the audition, it's a little bit off topic, but being such a well-respected and renowned actress that you are now, do you still have to audition or do you just get like- Of course. Like, I did one two, day, two days ago. I mean, look, to be honest with you, most of my work now comes to me as an offer, not because I'm some, you know, no, grand no, 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 yeah. person, but because you've seen enough of my work to know yeah. you either want me or you want someone else. And I have no problem with that. So you, you'll come to me and you offer me the role. And if it's something that's interesting, then you can say yes. But sometimes, particularly now, because so much work comes from other countries, they they require you to audition. And, and again, I have no problem with that. I had the most wonderful audition a couple of days ago, which I didn't get, which doesn't disturb me at all because it was never mine. But I had a lot of fun doing it and I learnt something doing it. And yeah. that's what's important to me. That's great. So yes, absolutely. But largely, no, not so much. But because the marketplace is different now, I'm auditioning for people whom I don't know and who don't know me. Do you know who created the character Lou Kelly behind the scenes? No, I can't remember who, and which is appalling. But I'm, you know, in those days I was such a dimwit. I, I don't even remember who the writers were. You know, I mean, now of course you, you, you know, you understand and you befriend the writer immediately because they're going to do the best by you. You know, and you want to know who they are and what they've written and where they've come from, and all of that is part of your education of becoming an artist who understands what everybody's part is. But in those days. I just turned up and did my best, you know, and tried to stay out of the way. <laughs> I've, got a, I've got a fan question from Abby yep. Jess. Of oh, yes. Dolphin. We saw yes. a glimpse of Lou about to be nice to Daphne when she was crying and she opened up a bit to Sister yep. Selby. Do you yep. think there could have been a storyline exploring this side of her or do you think she was just completely bad considering that Lou Kelly started out as a nice person did you know that she was going to turn into an evil character and, and were you happy for Lou to become so violent? Um, that's a, a number of questions in there, but it's a great question. Um, I think everybody has softness and sorrow and yearning and joy in their character in, a, in various percentages of form. And sometimes we lean more strongly into certain qualities or aspects of ourselves by virtue of our experience. And so Lou lent into certain aspects of herself because of her history. And, but that didn't eliminate that she had joy. And I think you saw that she had joy actually quite a bit. But I don't think what, what was most interesting for the writers was that aspect of her. And you have to understand as an actress what you are the device of and what your purpose is within the whole. And Lou's purpose within the whole was not to be the radiant, soft, vulnerable individual. That was not her, that was not the purpose of that device. And I was extremely happy for her to become violent because the opportunities for women to play that level of abuse on screen are absolutely minimal. And by playing that, it introduced and opened up for me a career for me, which I would never otherwise have had. 
because it meant that I could play real dark, real darkness and, and real aggression on, on a top tilt, which mostly women are disallowed from doing. So I grabbed it by the neck and ran with it and continue to run with it, frankly. It's such a, such a pleasure to do, to be given permission to be rage filled. I mean, it's fabulous and nobody gets hurt. <laughs> A fan question from AJ Harrison. Can we ask Louise if she's actually seen every episode and what was her favourite storyline to be involved in? Wow. No, I never watched it beforehand. And no, I didn't watch all the episodes. Look, to be honest with you, I don't have a favourite that stands out like, oh, I remember that. What I remember is the whole gamut of the experience, which was phenomenal, historical, extraordinary groundbreaking and I consider it an unbelievable privilege to have been a part of it because I was a part of changing the way the television world saw females and that was that show only existed for females men were sidekicks in that show they were I don't care how big their role was they were always sidekicks to the main game which was the women that was an incredible thing to be part of and it's never really been rap- replicated because let's bear in mind that Wentworth is a replication of Prisoner yeah. so it didn't it, it didn't introduce the form Prisoner introduced the form so I was part of something that was utterly groundbreaking and that's a remarkable thing and that doesn't happen too often you know so I I was really fortunate it was a great joy a tremendous I mean I laughed myself sick on that show <laughs> We um we spoke to Ros Gentle about this a few weeks ago. Um, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That you know, prior to getting on Prisoner, yeah, was it, a, was it the show that you had to be on? Like, was, before you got the part of Lou Kelly, was it like I, I can't, I want to get on this show? I mean, you had those small parts, but was it around town that you know everyone wanted to be on Prisoner at the time because it was being such a big show? No, I don't remember that. But I've got to be honest with you that I don't think I was involved as involved in the industry. Okay. and understood it as well as I do now it, you know and I was very young and uh, you know I'd I'd done certainly roles before prisoner but this was my first big long-term um contract and so I was just I mean I just went into it sort of blindly never having watched it um but I pretty quickly got that we were you know we were at the heart of whatever was going on in television land you were sitting right in the center of it if you were on prisoner and you know everywhere you went you you were known because you were part of this show that people were just gobsmacked by you know I mean we were gobsmacked by it you know so I can only but imagine what it was to watch it can you can you tell us whether you know the reason that you were given the name Lou as you know, it's, it's fairly unusual to be given the same character name as your actual name. I don't know, mate. <laughs> Maybe they thought I was a violent bitch in the flesh. I don't, I don't know. She's perfect. Maybe. Yes. She's perfect. perfect, just cast her. You know, um, <laughs> she's got the killer look. Yeah. I honestly, don't, again, I'm st- I wish I could tell you the answer, but I think they probably thought, I don't know, it's sort of, I think it's an easy name to remember. You know, and it's sharp and it's, I mean, I, you wouldn't have called a Louise Kelly, let's be clear. No. Well, read it. I mean, I call, I, I call myself Louise, but, you know, you, you wouldn't have said Louise Kelly. <laughs> Louise Kelly is coming. I mean, it doesn't have the same punch, but, you know, those single, those single sound names are really, they've got some, you know. Yeah. So I guess that's why they used it. They probably thought, Lou, Lou, why not? There's a uh, there's a few scenes of you on prisoner where you're smoking, not a lot. Oh, I know. You knew, you knew there was trouble brewing when Lou was having a smoke, and she smoked that <laughs> cigarette like there was something going to go down, and <laughs> it was great. <laughs> did, did you smoke in real life, or was you actually smoking on the show? Uh, I only woke up so I could smoke. <laughs> I mean. I was so glad that we started at like 4, 4.30 in the morning because it gave me more smoking time, (laughs) you know. I mean, I just could smoke all day, every day. But I mean, fortunately, because my husband um, wanted to give up, we went and had hypnotherapy and I gave it away 100 years ago. But, you know, for the years that I was on prisoner, and in those days, let's be clear, we could smoke in the green room. I mean, can you imagine how hideous it must have been for the people who didn't smoke? And we were flat out. So those rooms, it was like, you know, it was just a fog in there. 
Uh, it was like, it was, you know, it was like the, the skyline of Los Angeles sitting over the top of, I mean, it was just horrible. And, but, uh, you know, you could smoke on stage real cigarettes. You can't do that now. I mean, good Lord. The stuff we were getting away with was insane, absolutely insane. People swinging off buildings and all this shit. When, I mean, it was mad, but it was a different period of history. So, yes, I smoked and, oh, God, it was wonderful. So I could light up any time I liked. And the hypnotherapy worked. Shocking. Yeah, I gave it up that day. I never smoked again. I didn't even want to give up. I went in. I had hypnotherapy. The guy said to me, you'll never smoke again. I thought, yeah, yeah, sure. I never smoked again. Wow. From that day to this, I've never smoked another cigarette and so happy about it. I never have never missed it. Yeah. Never had the urge. It's bizarre. I said that Ken a while back. I'm sure the uh, tobacco companies made millions of dollars just out of prisoner with the amount of cigarettes oh. on the show. Oh, can you imagine the amount of cigarettes that were going? Because I mean, it wasn't just me. Everybody smoked in those days. Maggie and Annie and you know anyone who was there was smoking like chimneys i mean really well there was a pool of cigarette smoke you had to fight your way through to get into the green room i mean it was horrible you'd come home stinking we we all know about health and safety back in those days yeah so. yep. um was there a storyline that that you suggested at any time um or or that that the producers used or didn't use and and did you ever look at a storyline and think this is not lou kelly I don't remember. They weren't in my memory. They weren't wanting for us to make broad suggestions about. I mean, I think they followed if they thought there was a character aspect or quality that they could use, which was my introduction of more comedy for Lou. But they certainly weren't, I don't think, seeking us out to devise plotting. The one that I do remember vividly having a problem with, I can't remember who it was that was pregnant, but I think I was the cause of her losing the child by oh, getting into a fight or kicking yeah. kicking her or something. And I remember having a real problem with that, feeling like that had kind of tipped into something that wasn't quite, you know, it didn't. And I remember having a conversation with Annie feeling about it and being genuinely terribly upset by it and feeling like, you know, Lou was brutal, but she wasn't an idiot. Why, why would you do that? I mean, that was just, that's really like crossed a line or across the line for me, you know. I just thought, mm, no, I don't, I, don't, I don't buy this. Next question, sort of two questions wrapped up into one because there's a fan question as well. Um, yeah, yeah. And it's interesting, this question, because I read an article a long time ago about Vivian Gray, who played uh, Mrs. Mangle on Neighbours. And oh, yeah. she said she copped a lot of abuse in the street while she was on Neighbours playing such a, you know, she was the busybody of Neighbours. Now, you playing such a villain on Prisoner, did you find that when you're in public or in the streets and just, you know, your day-to-day -day life, you copped anything from, you know, people in the street? Being Lou was so... No, they loved her. They loved her. People loved Lou. I mean, you know, I had a very interesting experience um, a couple of years ago when I went to London to do uh, one of the events for Prisoner. And I had the great good fortune to go to a dinner and talk to some of the fans at this dinner. It, it was a solo one. It was just myself at this event. And uh, there was a young couple there who came, I, I was talking to them and they were very young. And I said to them, good Lord, you're so young to have, watched. and they said, oh, we've watched every episode. We loved Lou. And, and I said, gosh, why? You know, they were these really soft, beautiful people. And they said, we were carrying a child, you know, together they had a child, she was pregnant and they lost the child. And they said, and we started to watch Prisoner and we fell in love with Lou. And I said, why? And she said, because we felt by watching her, some of the anger we felt about losing that child was taken away by Lou. By watching somebody be that angry, it gave them a sort of a freedom to let go of this terrible pain. And I thought it was one of the most beautiful things I'd ever heard. And it also made me think, you don't know what your characters provide. And... What a wonderful thing that Lou, who was completely misrepresented as a bad person, provided this access point for these two young people to offload some of their grief. I thought that was astounding. Wow, that's amazing. Amazing. Justin Egley from Tokyo said that- Oh, you know, wow. Yeah, you're an amazing <laughs> character wow. on the show. Um, he'd like to know about your actual fame and- also, did you, how did you feel in the role? Many actors just do it for paycheck and it's boring, but did you enjoy it? Which obviously you, you did. 
And he said, it's think I think it's fair to say Lou is one of the most iconic characters in the show. She should be proud. She created a lasting legacy. Oh, oh, bless. Yeah. All the way in time. Um, yeah, amazing. Isn't that beautiful? Oh, thank you so much. I'm very moved by that. I have never, ever in my entire 40, over 40 year career, gone to the workplace with anything but love in my heart for it. I am I even to talk about it moves me. It still does. I don't know what it is, but it just moves me. And I feel like I got unbelievably lucky to do something that I love that helps me grow as a human being. And that provides like that story I just told conduits for people to unfold their own lives. I, I just think that's incredible. Yeah. And I'm interested in the nature of art and what it does for a community and what its service to community is. And that's why I continue to study as I do every day in some form. I never, I never a day passes where I'm not doing something toward my work as an actor, trying to improve, trying to get better. I love it. And I, and I love it more now than I ever did, even when I began, because now I understand what the duty of it is. And I just think that that's remarkable uh, that I get to, to do this. I mean, dear God, wow. You know, so no, I never turn up and think, oh, it's just a job. And, I, and strangely, I mean, it's one of my weakest things is I always forget to ask how much I'm getting paid, <laughs> which is not a good thing. I mean, you should be more kind of, you know, I mean, that's why you have an agent, but it's not the most interesting part of it. But of course, you, everybody likes to make money and, and I like to be paid well for doing a good job. And I always do a good job to the best of my ability. So I want to be pay, properly paid, but I don't go into it thinking, oh, that's the first thing I'm going to think about. Because if you did, I don't think you'd be getting a lot of satisfaction from your work. Yeah, it's actually the job you're enjoying. Yeah, I want that to pay me back. And I want to work with other professional people who regard it in the same light. I don't want to work with painful people. That I'm done with. I definitely, or abusive, I know, no, no. But I think they're confused about what their position in the world is. Yeah. I'm an actor. That's what I do for my living. It doesn't make me special or different or above or b below. It means that's what I do. And I'm essential. I'm essential to the well-being of a whole. And, you know, the, the other person who's coming as a, as a butcher, a baker, a candlestick maker, whatever they are, they are equally as important. I can't be in the world if they don't do their job. But I, if you're coming to do the job with me, I want you to do it well and to the best of your ability. And I want you to show it some reverence. That's how I feel about it. It's important. What I do is important. Definitely. You had some um, very good one-liners. Yeah. One of them being rack off. She would give you so much syrup, you'd get diabetes and many others. Did you have, did you have a favourite? Did you have a no, favourite? I, I think I once said something about, listen, you bitches. I think she was always calling people bitches. And what's interesting, it's become sort of the vernacular, hasn't it? You know, get those bitches out of here, take those bitches, listen, bitches, you know. So, I mean, I was ahead of, Lou was ahead of the curve, really, wasn't she? She was already onto that phrase a long time back. I mean, I think there were so many great phrases, but to kind of isolate one would be silly because at the time when you're saying them, they're always fun, aren't they? Particularly if you're with somebody who's equally, you know, like a Jackie Woodburn, who's got an unbelievably sensitive um, sense of humour, who was impossible for me to work with because the two of us just would laugh endlessly together. <laughs> we'd send each other up. I mean, if you've got an actress like that who you're going to play with, you know, you're working, you've got all the stops out to make sure that you get them laughing. Wow. You know, it's the first to go. And you had some very intense parts with her on the show. So that, that's interesting. Yeah. Hear. And we remain good friends. I mean, you know, that, that, that was the other thing about that show was I came in at a time when there was a, where there was a band of young people coming in, all of a very similar age, Glenda, Jackie, Deborah Lawrence, blah, blah, blah. So there was a group of us who all came in together and we remain friends. I mean, you know, all these years later. That's amazing. From that one show. Wow. Great women, amazing women. With the, um, when you were given the scripts, what was your method of memorizing your lines? Well, I mean, at that time I was working on, um, I, won't, I won't bore you with the technical jargon of it, but I was, I was doing a very sort of formal Stanislavski approach to things where I was asking all the right questions and I had all the books that would teach me how to do how to prepare a script that's changed over time and I do a whole lot of different things um, I mean this morning because of the show I'm working on at the moment 
Um, I, I was in class with my teacher in America this morning and we're, we're just at the beginning of a process. So there's a whole, diff and I have like six or seven different ways around, you know, combining different techniques to get the work into my body. But mostly it's, it's about understanding what the story is. I don't learn the lines, I learn the story. And then, then you'll, rem because if you're just learning lines, you're not going to remember anything because that's a sort of like on the top of the memory base. So you want to get it in under that. So you're learning about why I'm going, how I'm going, when I'm going, with whom am I going? You know, it's much more interesting for me that way. That's interesting. And I learn by movement. Do you actually remember ever shooting a, a really serious scene on Prisoner that you ever got wrong and had to keep reshooting? I can't. Maybe you can. Uh, no, I remember. I remember vividly laughing inappropriately. Working with Maury Fields was a challenge in itself because Maury <laughs> would, particularly when Maury was raping me, he decided that he wanted to fart his way through the scene. So, so I had to contend with Maury pretending to rape me and fart, and then laughing into my shoulder. And oh, he's actually was, really you know, farting, like a real fart. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, those sorts of things were terribly funny. And I am a shocking, shocking uh, mark on getting people to make me laugh. I mean, and once I go, I, you know, there could be any number of times before I could come back. And I remember doing it with somebody, I think it might have been Jackie. And the director came down from the booth onto the floor. He was so enraged. I just couldn't stop laughing. So I remember those more than I remember I mean, of course you screw things up and you forget lines or you move in the wrong place or it doesn't feel right or something. I mean, that happens on every job, but that's not such a, I mean, you don't want to be doing that too much because what they rely on is that, you, you're, that you're professional so that you can get the job done in the shortest amount of time because it's all about money. Yep. So, you know, they don't want 20 takes, they want three. But no, I, that was, I, they were a pretty slick group, you know. They, they, they knew their stuff. They knew how to make a scene and make it quick. Your hairstyle is always talked about with the fans. There was one comment that said uh, Lou Kelly would have burnt a hole in the ozone layer. Would totally. You... I'm responsible for the whole thing. How long did it take to do that hairstyle? And was that your idea? I did it myself. Oh, you did it yourself? Oh, yeah. It was my idea. Yeah. So I used to just turn my head upside down in the morning and get a can of hairspray and then just go. And I'd roll it. And depending on how I felt on the day, I just keep rolling it until I got the size I wanted. And the longer my hair got, the bigger it got. I found it hilarious. Well, but yeah, that was that was me. I did that hair. I mean, we didn't have any makeup. I mean, what makeup was I on? You know, I mean, it was also I was you know twenty something. Christ, I mean, that was the last thing I needed was to be made up. Now, I mean, you need a dim room and plenty of it. But you know, in those days, I mean, you could be out of bed at four o'clock and look fabulous. You know. I mean, fabulous in the sense that you were, you know, clear and didn't need help. But yeah, the hair was me. And did you tell as long as I had the hair and my sneakers, I was done. Did you tell the crew that you were doing that hairstyle, or was it you just walked in with it one morning and said, "This is this is Lou"? I think it sort of. I think it started like a little lower, and then as time went on, <laughs> it's just. Like, <laughs> I think it grew as Lou grew. You know what I mean? Like I grew into the hair. Did you actually have any idea that you'd, you'd be in for 151 episodes when you sort of began? No, had no clue. You know, it's really interesting. You don't have, you don't have any, you know, despite what people say, you, don't, you have very little control over how your career will go because there's, a, I mean, there's luck and there's hard work and there's perseverance and there's all those things and there's hanging in there and so on. But there is an element of luck. You know, there just is. And some characters stick and some characters don't. And I think Lou was one of those characters and it's to do with history and when she was developed, that she came at a time when people just found that level of downright violence from a woman interesting. So, and, and it, for whatever reason, she, she, people enjoyed her. I mean, there's no way of knowing with a character. Some characters click and some characters don't. And, you're, you're, and it can be coming from your work too. I mean, some of them, they like you and some don't like you and others, you know. So you, you, there's no way of knowing. I mean, I think Lou could have gone on and on had I wanted her to go on or on, but I didn't. I, I wanted to, to finish. Oh, so that was your choice to, you wanted to... You wanted yeah, to... which is why I think they killed her in the way they killed her. 
Do I have a question about that a little bit later? <laughs> um, are you able to tell the fans what a typical day on prison was like, just from like shooting your, you know, the scenes, learning lines, rehearsals? When you're doing turnaround TV like that, which to be honest, I mean, I think even Neighbours or a Home and Away, I'm, I think they're only half an hour, but Prisoner was an hour. You know, that, that's a lot of TV. And so we would rehearse at the beginning. The, I think it was Monday, Tuesday, or might have even been Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. But also in those same days, you would be shooting as well. So you'd be rehearsing the next episodes and shooting the previous episodes. So they'd be staggering the cast coming into the rehearsal room. On a normal day of shooting, you would be in studio at sort of 5, 5.30 into, to, well, makeup. I mean, you know, doing my hair. You get dressed and you're on set sort of, you know, then they break and breakfast the crew and then you're on set and you're on set all day. And in those days, you could be on set, oh, well, certainly well through to, you know, early evening. And then you would go home, you'd learn whatever you were learning for the next day and it would start all over again. Uh, you, had, you, you always have to have a 10-hour break. So there would be a 10-hour break between when you stopped and when you came back again. And then your weekend is spent learning the lines. So when you do turn around telly, because particularly if you're a big, you've got a big role in it, you'll have a lot of words. And the best way to do it is you, you prepare it on the weekends because to actually come in after a 12-hour day and try learning lines, for me, that, that's like, it's just not going to happen. So I prepare all my work on the Saturday and the Sunday so that by the Monday when I go into rehearsal and shoot I'm, I'm across both things and, I, and I'm not trying to learn something new while I'm doing that okay. I know that on the weekend I'm going to learn the next bit so I'm ahead of the game by the time I get in there on the Monday but that's that's for me they're long days tell it tell his long days yeah and there's a lot of waiting you know I mean tv is a lot about waiting you know really in essence you're probably on set for about you know actually shooting for about 45 minutes to an hour on a normal oh. day but there's rehearsal, there's the setup, there's, you know, there's makeup, there's whatever it is you're doing. Now, you and Lois Collander, who played Alice Lurch Jenkins, worked quite closely together on the show and the major storyline, yes, The Riot, which we will discuss a bit further down the track. What was it like working with Lois? Lois is one of the, the great good people. She was and remains a hugely decent loving individual and it was a great pleasure to have her as my sidekick uh, because she was one she was great company but she was just a really professional decent balanced human being uh, and she was always like that and you know great sense of humor lots of fun but always ready you never had to wait for Lois she was never unprepared it's a wonderful thing to work with an actress like that but we were just we were also good friends yeah there was a great chemistry between you two you know she was very different than me yeah. and I think that's you know sort of the Laurel and Hardy thing it's you know you want them to be absolutely different than one another and then it kind of goes oh that's an interesting you know it's Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis you know it's it's like whoa how does that work well you know one's the straight guy and then there's this other thing yeah and I think Lois and I tapped into that it was very smart of them to put us up as you know these two dimwits running around trying to accomplish things together you know <laughs> You were, uh, you were involved in some pretty major storylines from, from riots and rapes and bashing offices and, and, and all sorts of things. I mean, we, we could talk all day about a lot of the episodes you're in, but did you feel an overwhelming pressure when you were getting some of these storylines? That, that, like, were they mentally exhausting, some of those scenes that you had to do? Um, there's one scene I want to talk about shortly, but yeah. Yep. Um, how, how did you um, that on? I think that doing that show was a pressure. There was, no, there was no doubt it was a pressure, but it was a thrilling pressure. But you, you were aware that you were under pressure because you were on a very, very high rating show that had the plans to stay that way. You know, and the producers made that absolutely clear to you that you were in this very you know, high rating show that they wanted to keep going. So you needed to, you needed to raise to the bar of that, not drag the show down. And, and, you know, that's no problem. I, I mean, I just worked to that and I looked around me and kind of spotted the people who I could emulate to, to achieve the best road into that, like an Annie Phelan, who's just was just like a worker. I mean, just a worker. She was such a great example. So in that way, I mean, look, I think performing is a pressure at any time, learning the work, trying to do the work well, working with a lot of other people. And in that circumstance, you're working in violent environments, which make people very tetchy. 
and Lou was, I had to access aspects of me that were kind of mean and, you know, I mean, we were in that place for a long time through the day and that, you know, that you, you've got to, you've got to keep a grip on that. And, it, but it can make you jumpy, but I was meant to be jumpy. Yeah. So you can't, you can't have me being one thing and then tell me I can't, yeah. then you're unhappy with, but, but if you want me fired up, then I've got to be fired up, you know, but it was all part of it. But any job, I mean, you know, house husbands, Jane, they're all, they're stressful, but they have different qualities of stress attached to them. The problem with the violence is particularly for someone like Lou, who was physically very violent over many years. Eventually, I just didn't want to do it anymore. I just didn't want to be violent anymore. You take- just get to a point where you, that's enough. That's enough. I'm done here. You, you actually work with a, a lot of people who, who are no longer with us. Can you give us some snapshots of... Gerda Nicholson, who played Anne Reynolds. Peter Adams, who played Bob Moran. Oh. Uh, Annie Phelan as Myra Desmond. Sheila Florence as Lizzie Birdsworth. And Joy Westmore as Joyce Barry. All remarkable, weren't they? Just remarkable human beings and beautiful actors. I mean, Gerda Nicholson, good Lord. One of the most dignified, elegant human beings I had ever had the good fortune to be in a room with. And her husband, Juicy, was just, as a couple, just perfectionist people and so unbelievably kind to me as a young person. But working with Goethe was always that thing, that it, like you were in this rarefied sort of royal air. It was a wonderful thing. Peter Adams was, became a great friend and I worked with Pete on a number of occasions. And he was a beautiful, beautiful man. And I had nothing but time for him. All of those people that you mentioned all had an effect upon me because I was so much younger than all of those people. And every last one of them is missed. But I think the person who had the greatest effect on me simply because of time and tide and who I was at that stage and my age and the difference of ages and so was Annie because Annie was relentlessly kind to everybody. And she loved being an actress and she was a great actress. And I had the good fortune to be in the room with her and to watch her. And she helped me enormously to find a road for myself uh, and not to be afraid of being an individual within the business. Because it's, you know, there's a lot that happens to young women. And fortunately, by having that influence of Annie at that time, I think it really helped keep me on a road that's been the road of my career, which has been a kind of an individual road. I was never hooked up. You know, I was not somebody's girlfriend or their wife or their blah, blah, blah. My characters have always been standing solo. And that's been an incredible thing for me. I've been very fortunate with that. But it began there. The, um, there was a lot of writers on Prisoner. There was, I mean, there was numerous writers. Um, at the Amazing the prison still existed, really, isn't it? <laughs> Did you ever get the script and sort of see the writer on the front cover and go, oh, wow, this is going to be a... It's going to be a good episode. This can be good for Lou. Was there anything you ever thought like that? No, I don't. I think I, I, I loved it if I got a script and there was lots of stunts in it because I loved doing the stunts and we had great stunt guys, you know, and you could be, you know, crazy stuff, swinging off, you know, buildings and being, you know, hanged off ceilings and, you know, punching and getting into brawls with people. I mean, I loved all that. It was terribly dangerous. I mean, I was punched and kicked and all of that, slapped and so on and so forth. And, chipped a tooth and you know various things but just having the opportunity to do that with these guys who were all martial arts experts and you know I mean they were teaching you stuff I mean you would never be allowed to do that now it wouldn't just simply wouldn't happen you know so yeah I loved all that it was great it was great to be put in a position but I never thought oh what what am I going to get I just thought if I got something wonderful, God, isn't this amazing? Isn't this thrilling? You know, and let's try and do the best I could do at it. Lou, Lou Kelly had, had seen many inmates leave Wentworth or die in Wentworth. What's it like on set when a cast member has their final scene? And, and obviously we know one in particular. Any, any that really stand out to you? I think whenever you do a long running show and you become a unit, you become a family, with these other people, because to be honest, you're with them more than you're with anybody else. Particularly if you've got a big role, if you've got a lead role, you're there 12 hours a day with these people, certainly somewhere in the vicinity of that. They are your family for the duration of that show, which is why actors 
come in and out of these relationships with people so intimately because they're with them all day. So when somebody leaves or you leave, which is the flip side of that, it's heartbreaking, but it's part of people going on to do what they want to do, you know, which I did, which other people did. So you're always saying hello and goodbye to people and that's part of it. But we're doing that in life, aren't we? It's like a replication, <laughs> a microcosm. <laughs> Yeah, well, but I'm lucky because I've got to meet all these people, you know, I'm so lucky. And some of them have been incredible and they remain in my life and they're important to me. That's fantastic. Would you have, um, would you have liked to see Lou become more of a permanent top dog, say like Rita or B Smith or, or Nora, or are you happy with the little time? No, I, I, to be honest with you, I think what was interesting about her was that she was always struggling to get somewhere. Yeah. You know, when you get somewhere, it's less interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Like when you're there, you're there, part of the part of the journey is over. But you know, when you're railing against something, there's a lot of energy in that. You're striving to get that portion of whatever it is that you imagine is going to satisfy you, which of course it never does completely. So I think for Lou, the thing of being always in opposition to other people was one more interesting to watch, but it's a hell of a lot more interesting to play. For me. Did you, uh, at the time, did you get lots of fan mail for Lou Kelly when you're on the show? I, st I still get lots of fan mail for Lou Kelly, which is really extraordinary. I mean, to this very day, I'm, you know, usually most weeks I'm sending something to somebody uh, who's kindly asked for a memory of that, which I'm more than happy to do if, if I can. But yeah, I mean, that, that show created an, a huge amount of fan mail which is very gratifying when you're doing a show because you can also be in shows that nobody even notices. You know, and I've been in those ones too. They roll over like dead something and n nobody even remembers that you were in the damn thing, you know. So to be in something where people remember, I mean, that's incredible. But, you know, that's incredible that 40 something years on, we're sitting here having this conversation about a show I made when I was in my 20s. It's amazing. As Top Dog, what was it like to be able to operate the big steam press. <laughs> you look great on the press. So Doesn't she look press. cool on the press? <laughs> with the smoke and the leg, leg up. up. I, love the, I love the leg up with, yeah. the, with the smoking, you know, like, like what the hell is that? Well, on a steam press, you know, let's get clear. You're operating an iron. <laughs> 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 and the coolest thing you can do is operate an iron. <laughs> you know, <laughs> something so funny about that for me so I mean I think there was more about that you know and of course everybody would be taking the piss if it was you that was on that thing you know <laughs> very funny very funny stuff you know as grown people you know let's this is what I always say let's remember that I was a grown person putting on a bloody denim outfit and winding my hair around like a lunatic and then going in there and smoking cigarettes on an iron <laughs> Well, I was a grown person pointing a camera at you at the time. That's right. That's right. It's funny whenever you think of Lou, though, you always think of that that vision of her on the press with her leg up, the smoke. Do you? And the, yeah, oh, I, I fantastic. love it. Fantastic. Oh, fantastic. Fantastic. They're I'm, sort of iconic in images, aren't they? I mean, they're yeah. funny how you create an iconic image and you don't know at the time that that's what it's doing. Yeah. But, I don't know, it taps into the DNA of what we consider to be cool, isn't it? Yeah, it was great. <laughs> now we get to the story breakdowns. The season seven, yeah. episode two, number 507, wow. written by Ian Coglin and David Phillips, oh, yeah. by Sean Nash. Oh, the God. Wayne Lavender, Jeff Biggs, and yours truly. You had some powerful scenes in this episode with Maury Fields. Uh, who played Len Murphy? He enters your cell at night and tries to rape you. Well, we know what. Yeah. <laughs> Ferguson is onto it and opens the cell door just as it's about to happen. And then they get yeah. into a fight. How did you cope yeah. with Len Murphy as he was quite a big man? And I worked with him a lot actually before that, especially when he slams you into the cell door. And what do you recall yeah. of Murray Fields? And I, I remember he liked a beer or two. Murray did love a beer or two, but I tell you what, you know, like so many of those those people, they they're a di they're a, they don't really exist now. I mean, Murray was one of the great human beings, wasn't he? I mean, he was a decent, 
funny, charming, relentlessly happy, very professional, very skilled. I just adored him and his wife, both of them. Great, good human beings. Remarkable. I was incredibly fortunate to have worked with him. I loved it. I loved every second of him. Would have, I'd work with him every day of the week. He had a wicked sense of humour. Shocking. Shocking. And he had me pegged within two seconds. He saw me <laughs> like roadkill. I mean, it was fantastic. And I thought, I'm, de- I'm dead here. I'm completely dead. But I loved every second with him. Couldn't wait to be in the room with him. Yeah, you had some amazing scenes together. And just on the back of Ken's question, there was a scene with you in the governor's office where you going to apologise to him saying, you know, because now he's acting governor and Lou's trying to suck up to him and, you know, sorry. <laughs> a lot of good that will do, yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and he puts his arm around you and starts walking you out and then grabs right into your neck and, you know, he's being played by better girlies than you. And what was that scene like? Was that, like, was he actually hurting you? Well, again, I don't remember it specifically, but Maury would never hurt you. That no, was for yeah. sure. And, and all those scenes were rehearsed and you would have had a, the stunt guy would have told us how to do it correctly and all of that. Yeah. But because Maury was an incredible pro, I mean, everything was done by the book, you know, and had, and had unbelievable actor's chops in terms of his skills base. Uh, he just knew how to do stuff. But, you know, it was also, you know, there's a perfect example that, Maury was playing somebody who was doing terrible things. Yeah. But because he has a light touch and he did it with a light touch and that makes it much more terrifying. It's when you get all kind of dark and I'm going to be, you know, then, then you go, oh, I don't care. But, you know, if you get a light touch on something and then, you know, they, I, it, that's terrifying. That, that's really terrifying. And, yeah. you know, those psychotics, that's how they do it. They seduce you and then they'll stab you in the middle of the chest, you know. Yeah. So, and I think that's why Maury and Lou were a great kind of playoff against each other because we both went into it with a light touch and then it turned really very dark. Yeah, they were, they were intense scenes, those ones. Yeah, really yeah. Great stuff to do, though. Yeah. Great stuff to do. And a woman with a man doing gr- with that sort of darkness? Oh, fabulous. I should have that every day of the week. I should be doing that. Love it. Yeah, I mean, going back to the cell scene where he tried to rape you and you had the fight with yeah. him and he goes out and then Maggie Kirkpatrick's out by the cell door trying to set him up and then they get who, into the punch. Who was, no, who was no lightweight either. Let me, <laughs> let, let me be clear on that. Yeah. And was, Maggie and I remain great friends, but, you know, she was no lightweight. I've got a, I've got a question, a fan question from Gillian Bunting um, asking oh, yeah. about Trevor Kent oh. and, and the other Wood, Woodridge inmates. What, what were your thoughts on them? Trevor Kent, again, was a be- an absolutely beautiful actor. Make no mistake, a beautiful actor and an absolutely beautiful human being. I loved working with him. And I think he had something very, that he brought to that character that was incredibly dark and dangerous yeah. and really frightening. And when you worked with him, you felt that from him. And he was the softest, sweetest man. But there was something very dark in his um, portrayal of that character which I just loved. I thought, it, I thought it was right on point. I think it was sort of interesting having that group in there for a while. I don't think it would have lasted, but I think it was interesting to introduce a posse of men into that situation and have them be secondary characters. I, I think that was really clever. Going on to, this is a really interesting episode. So in season seven, episode 31, which is listed as 536, written by Coral Druin, directed by oh, Sean wow. Nash. Cameraman Wayne Lavender, Ken Mulholland and David Triscott, which first aired on the 14th of May 1985, was the flashback episode, which you don't see much in TV. It was a really interesting episode with uh, the nun, Anita Selby. And he's a frame. Oh, wow. And then Anita, you know, you got quite close to the nun in in Prisoner. Mm. And uh, Mm. you told her to go. Diane Craig. Yeah, Diane Craig. Yeah. What do you think of that episode being, you know, it was going the flashbacks back to, you know, the, it made it look like Lou had been in there since day one because you were talking about all the characters like Frankie mm, and mm, Lizzie. Mm, mm. Which, of course, she wasn't because otherwise you would have yeah. seen her, which yeah. was a bit weird. Yeah. But, but yeah, I mean, I think, I think those things can work. It's a bit like doing a voiceover at the beginning of something, isn't it? Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. But I think... What, what was in, probably interesting about that was looking at the breadth of character that had passed through that show, which was probably why they did it. I mean, not 
not being versed as to why they chose to do it, but I would say that they were looking at the arc of all of those incredible characters that came out of that show. And there was a lot of them. You know, it wasn't like there was just one. They, 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 there was this litany of these great women coming through, creating these extraordinary people. You look back through it and, I mean, there's a, there, some of those people, you know, like Tina and people like that who are great friends of mine, still mm. having huge careers today. You know, they're memorable, those actresses. They are unbelievably memorable and there's a reason. You know, when they come into the space and the room and they play, they're like, bang, they're in the space, you know? I really think that episode made your character a lot stronger by, as it went on from there, your character did get stronger, but it was, you know, making it seem like you'd been there since we, day one. I mean, we knew you yeah. hadn't, but it just made... We, it, which I actually hadn't, yeah. yeah. But it just made Which your, is sort of weird that they would do that, yeah. But then I suppose what they wanted to do was yeah. was embed her into the, to the, to the culture so that there was a feeling like she'd known everything that had happened, I thought which it was is interesting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, I agree with you. And the great one line you had when you were telling the nun at the gate. Oh, yeah. What did I say? Police, you said, go, go fry in hell, rack off. <laughs> <laughs> oh, always a good exit line. <laughs> now we get to the Wentworth Siege, which was um, season seven, episode 44, 45, 46 and 47, written by John Orksick, Faye Russo, James Simmons, Coral Druin, directed by Steve Mann, Tony Osaka, oh, yeah. Chris Adshead, and the cameramen were Wayne Lavender, Peter Hind, and Ken Mulholland. Big storyline on four episodes, which aired on the 25th of June, 85. And we see the end of Myra Desmond, played by Anne Phelan, and some other inmates. Arnie Ballinger has sent in a crew to break out Ruth Ballinger, played by Lindy Davis. And we can tell yep. them in business when they kill the guard on the gate, and then they shoot the second guard. Do you remember much about filming the siege scenes and how long these episodes took to shoot? Look, to be honest with you, I I don't. I don't. I, as I say to you, I don't have a vivid memory of specific episodes. I I have a, an overall memory of being th those years as as an experience across time. But I, I do seem to remember shooting a machine gun in the kitchen. Whether that was part of that, I don't know. But I yes. remember loving, was it? So, I remember yeah. absolutely loving doing that yeah. and thinking, God, this is fantastic. I want more of this. You know, <laughs> but, but, and I do remember that that siege was enormous, wasn't it? I mean, it was, it went on across, as you're suggesting, a number of episodes, but it was massive in terms of its design too. I mean, it included a lot of, <clears throat> a lot of the prison and there was scenes everywhere through that, which was sort of, which made the shooting schedule very heavy. And I think that particular one was extremely effective, if my memory serves me well. Yes. People responded to it very well, I think. Yeah. Well, yep. uh, the two, two memories that I have briefly was the sudden shock of actually seeing Anne finish her run in Prisoner. And, yeah, and shocking. That, that was a little bit by the throat. It, it got you by the mm. throat a little bit, even for the crew. Um, the mm -hmm. other thing that I remember was, was that the Raiders, the actual men that, that had come in to, to get Ruth Ballinger out, tended to stay in character. They didn't mm -hmm. seem to come out of character at all, you know, even off the set. I don't have memory of that, but, but I'm sure that that's probably right, you know. But those sorts of situations, Ken, they do, you know, I mean, that happened to my character a lot. If you're in that world where you're having to be dark and violent and aggressive, over a period of a day or a week or whatever it is, it's not something you can just step away from. Oh, now I'm going out for a cigarette and a coffee and I'll just forget about it. I mean, it's, you've, you've excited that aspect of yourself. And so that aspect of you has to remain excited for that period of time, particularly if you're doing a large scale siege endeavor like that that went on over, over a period of time. So it does, you know, you don't, your body just doesn't turn on and off like that. It's, it's just not designed that way. You get, you get the fragrance of that traveling with you across a day. So I can appreciate, and, and for some people also, that's how they work. You mm. know, they don't, they don't want to be chopping and changing. It's too difficult. So they just stay on point in that place for the period that they're working. And, and I have no problem with that. You do your thing, however it makes you, however best you can do it. So the Lou Kelly riot, which I call it because these episodes are completely driven by you. Now, 
I have learned online, it's a real fan favourite, these episodes. So it was season eight, wow. 12 and 13, written by Ian Smith, Alistair Webb, directed by Steve Mann, Kendall Flanagan. The cameramen were Ken. Oh, Mark, my God. Colin Christmas and Malcolm Daff. Yeah, they are an absolute fan favourite, these two episodes. Wow. One of the biggest riots in Wentworth. And you've got some great scenes with, uh, with you know, Peter Adam, mm. Bob Moran. Mm. But the start of it, which I love, the first scene with you and Lurch, you're telling Lurch you're going to take prison over. She's <laughs> like, Lurch is a real bit, a little bit shocked. And you're like, don't get smart. How's that going to look? Don't do it. <laughs> you know? Were you happy with the right storylines? Did you, did you really enjoy it? I loved all that stuff. I mean, anything where she was, you know, creating mayhem and running mad and being chaotic. I, I, I mean, I just think that was right in her wheelhouse. And... You know, there, again, it's to be able to play something epic and majestic as a female on that level is so fabulous. And I got to do that. And I've done it a lot in my career. It's a wonderful thing because, you know, often they'll get females playing, you know, you're cutting sandwiches or attending to children. Not that either of those things is a bad thing, but they're not particularly interesting or majestic to play. So anything where you can propel yourself into this, large scale arena of emotion is got to be a great place for an actress to go well I got to do that a lot and then in that those episodes again not that I remember them vividly but I remember the feeling of being in that environment and the kind of the the pressure and the, the lunacy of it you know and you get taken up by this sort of lunacy which is fabulous because then it's like it's on you know and then everybody gets infected by it and we're all on together, you know. I mean, that, that's fun because yeah. nobody's going to get hurt. I mean, everybody knows that we're pretending. So, you know, it's not like anyone's going to get hurt, but they're, they're, they're great things to do. They're Shakespearean. The next scene, which was a very intense scene, and I, I remember yep. it fairly vividly, was uh, wow. Eve Wilder played by Linda Stoner. Oh, um, God, getting hanged? Out, <laughs> yes. We find out that she's the phantom lagger you're in the dining room with Eve hanging from the roof. You pull the chair from under her. She wasn't hanging from the roof. Well, she was noosed up she to the roof. She was noosed up to the roof, yeah. How did you feel at that juncture? Not good, Ken, not good. But I tell you what, can you imagine them letting me do that now? I just don't think that would ever get through to the keeper in today's world. I mean, and I think it, I have to be honest with you, I think it's pretty remarkable television. I mean, it's brutal, it's brutal, but, you know, as a scene, when you see that, it's thoroughly shocking. It's shocking on every level to see women doing that. And I think it was incredibly important to show the capacity that a woman has for rage in a public domain where people have to witness it. I think it's incredible. Yeah, I mean, you... And really important. I was so lucky that I did that scene. And I was lucky I was doing it with Linda Stoner, who is just gorgeous. I mean, but that, I, think that... it's a, I think it's a memorable, memorable, memorable thing. That ride I could talk about all day, but especially you. Oh, wow. Uh, well, I re-watched it. I mean, I remember it, but I re-watched it, you know, a few weeks back. And your character, I mean, the way you were playing the character, your eyes were glassy and the look on your face. I mean, it was so real. I mean, it was just real. You, you thought you were there. Yeah, hideous. Yeah, it was horrible, wasn't it? It was it's amazing. shocking. When I pulled that chair, it's shocking, isn't it? You, you, I mean, even if I had to watch it, a couple of the fan things I've been to, they've played it. I mean, I gasp. I think to myself, Jesus, how did they let me do that? Because who is that? Who is that when she's pulling that chair? I mean, you know, God, wow. There's another scene in the laundry, which is another fan favourite. A lot of fans say this is probably the most iconic scene in Prisoner is the fight between Rita and Joan, which is orchestrated by yourself. Oh, yeah. You put them in the laundry and you've told them, <laughs> winner's got to kill the loser. <laughs> That's it. None of you coming out. What was that like shooting that scene? If you well, I mean, what's interesting is both those girls are very tall. So you're dealing with two very tall, quite you know, they've both got very powerful physical presences. And I think that that added to that. It added to the violence of that because Lou in and of herself was a much lankier, leaner, wiry, jumpy kind of character. And you got these two kind of rocks either side. I think that was, I think that was an interesting mix to witness. Generally, I think that was an interesting mix to witness. 
you know, Lou was like a cunning rat. She was always running somewhere. Whereas, oh. <laughs> yeah, whereas those two were much more kind of rock solid and slow moving. She was, you know. There's another scene in the laundry where Bob Moran walks in with the with a gun and you're holding a knife to the freak and telling them to, to give oh, up the yeah. gun. Mick Morris is holding the gun. You look completely in character. You're shaking, your eyes focused on Bob and Meg. Amazing scene again. What are your thoughts on how Rita just kicked you and Bob was able to grab you and it was all over for Lou Kelly? Well, I don't remember it distinctly, to be honest, again, but um, I don't know. Uh, I mean, just in your description of it, are you, are you maybe suggesting that there should have been more of a fight or...? Well, I, I was thinking that. Do you think there should have been more of a? Yeah, I think I think Lou is. I think Lou would have fought her way down a, a drain if necessary. Do you know what I mean? Like, I, I think she'd come out swinging no matter what the temperature was, because she was a lunatic like that. And once she got a taste for blood, you know, she wasn't about to kind of lay off just because somebody had arrived. I mean, I think she would fight you to the death. To be honest, she'd scratch your eyes out because also there was something about it that she loved. Like the taste of it, it was. A, it's a bit like you know Anthony Hopkins in um, whatever that thing was. With, you know, I'm going to eat your liver with a Silence of the Lambs. Yeah. You know, I'm going to eat your liver with a nice Chianti. I, I think that's Lou. Do you know? I think there was a sort of a psychosis aspect to her that once she kicked into the blood thing, she was just like she's gone. She's blacked out. She's somewhere, and that that allowed her to be that brutal. Because you couldn't have had any sort of humanity. Your humanity couldn't be on the front foot and be driving. That, an experience like that you'd have to be bloodlust season eight episode 21 which was written by michael joshua directed by ken oh. and the cameramen mm. were uh peter hind wayne lavender and mark collins and i guess just, ken's not on this one because it was an outside scene the back of the riot and you've escaped and you're uh, hiding out at alice's mum's house <sighs> a pretty traumatic scene with um steve millichamp who sadly passed away in 2013 who, yes, uh, he did. Uh, rapes you, and um, you know. Yeah, uh, and I think I've got a shotgun or something, and I'm wearing yeah, a hat or something. Bully. Is that that one? Yeah. Kill mm. the whole family mm. after he uh, mm. rapes you. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> he was quite a big man, six foot three. But I mean, what was like? He was a huge man. Arm, yeah. I, I I do actually remember that scene because I remember I had a shotgun, and I remember strange what you remember, isn't it? I remember it was very cold, which I thought was perfect. And we were out in the country and I don't know where that was, but I remember what I remember is frost on the windows. Oh. Isn't it odd what you remember? And I remember being overjoyed because I had a shotgun and I thought, oh, great, we're going we're to do a little bit of that work, you know. And I loved all that stuff, you know, killing people and all of that. I mean, it's so much fun. But um, Steve was a lovely man, but he was, he was massive. He was huge. Yeah. I mean, he would eclipse the sun. So we, again, interesting to put Lou that, and in those days, I mean, I was very thin and wiry and, you know, uh, young. How tall are you, just out of curiosity? Uh, I'm about 5'9". Okay. I don't know what that is, about 175 or 6 or something. There's a big height difference uh, for that scene. Oh, he was huge. I mean, he was a mountain. Yeah. But so I think those sorts of differences are also great to look. You know, it's like um, uh, Lois and me. Those things on screen are very interesting. They create a dynamic. So me with Steve was another one of those sort of interesting dynamics. Fantastic. Great scenes, I thought, those scenes at that house. Yeah, they're amazing scenes. Mm. Very impressive uh, scenes. And you, you almost felt for Louise or Lou. Lou. Uh, <laughs> you almost felt a pang of empathy, sympathy mm. for when she's cornered like that. Mm. And then in that moment, Ken, I think, you know, you, you think to yourself, what kind of life could this person have had had she had greater opportunity? Yes. Had she been more, more encouraged, fostered, cared for prior to all of this? What could she have done? Because, you know, a woman with that kind of energy and drive about life, about that lustful about life, imagine what she could have done if she'd just been fostered in the right direction. And that's the, that, you know, that's the sliding door thing, you know, one, one will take you here and one, will, and Lou just happened to get sidelined into something that was not good, but you know, there was a potential there because she was bright. I mean, you know, she's strategic to be strategic. You've got to be bright. Now you're starring in a production coming up called yep. underneath Mrs. Miss Archer. 
this mm -hmm. September, October, which mm -hmm. looks pretty interesting. Can you tell us and the fans more about this production? Happily. Underneath Ms. Archer is a theatrical show, which myself and my colleague Peter Houghton, another actor, writer, director, uh, have written together. We've been working together on and off over decades, both as actor, act, actor, director, and as two co-creator writers. And so we've written this piece for ourselves. It's a two-hander for Peter and I. I play Kelly Archer, who's a head flight attendant on international flights. And Peter plays William Marshall, who was one of the signatories on the Magna Carta. And we come together in a time travel event after Kelly makes a mistake on a long haul fly, flight. And the mistake that she makes is filmed and goes viral. And then she's trolled on the internet. Oh. So it's the, it's the story of what happens to somebody when they are taken apart by public justice, when not everybody has all of the information. So, and, and it's a look at what, how, how history influences our lives. So Peter and I go into rehearsal on the 23rd of August and we open on the 24th of September at 45 Downstairs, which is a theatre in Flinders Lane in the city in Melbourne. And we have a two and a half week season with a view to then touring the show in 2022. So I would love you to come along and have a look. It's, it's a comedy um, and it'll be full of laughs. We'll put a link up on the uh, Talking Prisoner website as well to that and promote. That'd be great because uh, the box office is open at Forty Five Downstairs, so you can Amazing. you can get in there and buy tickets. Can we just do something before we wrap up? We haven't done this on Talking Prisoner yet. This is a first, so just be prepared. Uh, yeah, I'm just going to drop it on you. <laughs> You've yeah. just got five more minutes. Of course you, you are. Um, while I was on YouTube a few nights ago and um, looking, someone did a few videos of Lou Kelly, did a mashup of some scenes, okay? Yeah. There is a yeah. lot of comments. I mean, there was hundreds of comments. So I've just taken some wow. comments that I just want to read to you if that's okay. Some of them don't have names because they've got funny usernames, so I'll just I'll do my best here. I actually didn't mind Lou. She played a great villain during some of the more boring periods of the show with some great one-liners. Uh, goodbye, Kelly. After so many great moments and episodes, she's the ultimate evil top dog, really in terms of length and brutality. Make way for Maxwell, who is, well, not so good. Uh, I'm going to miss Lou. She was a total shit starter and she didn't always need to back up the fight. She was more evil than Joan sometimes. Rest in peace, Lou. Hope you enjoy fire and brimstone along with the torture. It was. Oh, God. Yeah. Ella Hornby said, as mad as it sounds, I think there was something a bit sad at seeing Lou's lifeless body on the floor. She was such an established oh. character by this time, and despite all of her terrorising, her death just never seemed quite right. We all knew how horrible and dangerous she was, but her death left a bit of a void in the show, at least up to the point when we felt she had gotten used to her departure. Characters like that make a show. It was almost as though she was the only baddie in the show we didn't want to see die. And I think in some crazy way, we kind of missed her. We shouldn't have, but we did. <laughs> <laughs> Just got a few more. Uh, Kat said, rest in peace, Lou, a truly great character who almost single-handedly kept my interest in the show over the last hundred episodes. Oh. Michelle Holloway said, Lou was the highlight of the series for me. Such a fine actress. Sad to see her go like that. Can't stand the ugly man. Creep, which I'm, I'm not sure who they're talking about there. Mm. I'm going to miss Lou Kelly's funny one-liners. Uh, Brian Spur said he's going to miss Lou Kelly. Bye, Kelly. The hairspray advert jobs will be rolling in for you now. <laughs> 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 um Little Miss Lou, Louise Siverson portrayed a great villain considering how young she was at the time. I've got a couple as well um, uh, from Tony Malvena and Liam Watts, who says Louise was his favourite and he missed her when she left. And Tony says she was a great actress on Prisoner and she is a great person. Oh. Wow, someone finally killed Lou Kelly. I suppose viewers would have been wanting it for some time, but you never thought she would ever be killed. She seemed somehow indestructible, and I suppose no one deserved it more than her, but still a horrible character. Great actress, though, but for a prison soap opera, a great character. And then oh. uh, Lisa Ann said, I don't ever want to watch the episodes after this now. So they're talking about after you've died. Now that Lou is gone... 
I know what else happens. I do like Lorelai, but she doesn't have much of a storyline. I might go back to the 200s. <laughs> I start all over again. <laughs> and then uh, end of an era with Lou gone, she was perhaps the best character in the show. I found her way more entertaining and engrossing to watch than any of the other prisoner classics that everyone keeps raving about. You were the top three characters in the show. Mark Jamie said Louise as Lou Kelly was as good as the series got when it came to acting. There were some pretty dodgy performances throughout Prisoner's Run. So when someone came along who totally pulled off the character, it was a standout and Lou Kelly was completely and tragically believable. A true testament to the writers and Louise's performance. Overall, the best baddie of the show by far, in my opinion, and maybe the funniest too, which I really think sums up uh, Lou Kelly and yourself. Oh, thank you <laughs> so, so much. There were some amazing comments. I just kept reading and reading. And I said to Ken, we've got to include these comments. Oh, that's so uh, kind. Thank you very much. It means a great deal to me. So I'm very, I'm very moved by that. Our time is at an end, but thank you so much, Louise. It's been wonderful talking to you again. Beautiful all. to see you, Ken. You, you, you were a great part of it, and I'm very grateful to see you. And thank you, Matt. It's a wonderful experience, and I'm glad that we can have these chats about a show that was so important to so many people. I feel very privileged. Thank you very much. Whatever support we can uh, put to your uh, new production, we will also. It's very kind of you. I'm very, very grateful. I look forward to seeing you at the show. Bye, Louise. Bye, Take care. Much love.